And now, Mystery Theater. I'm E.G. Marshall. From almost the beginning of time, the tellers of tales have been fascinated by the story of the being who leaves this life, makes a short trip to the regions of the dead, and then tries to find his way back again into the land of the living. Not always an easy thing to do. In fact, the ancient Roman poet Virgil said, if we may be permitted to update his words a bit, the way down to hell is a cinch. But the way back may present a few difficulties. Our story involves just such a trip. Why, why are you torturing me this way? You, my, my own mother. I'm not your mother. Your mother is dead. What you see before you... is horrible. I'm afraid of you. Where's the love you always showed for me? The kindness, the gentleness. Look into my eyes. What do you see? Dead, black, yellow eyes with no pupils. Show pity on me, Katie. Show mercy. I have no mercy, no pity. I am a body without a soul. A living corpse that wishes you everything evil. Nothing but evil. Because I loathe and despise you, my soul. Our mystery drama, The Death of Halpin Fraser, is based on the classic short story by the celebrated American author Ambrose Bierce. It was adapted and especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Michael Wager. The end of life is often accompanied by greater changes than many of us will admit. We have heard, for example, that the spirit of a dead person may occasionally come back to haunt the living, taking the physical form of the body that spirit once inhabited. But there are other times, we are told, when the body returns without the spirit, without the soul that had animated that body in life. Our story is concerned with just such a phenomenon. A dark night in the midsummer of the 1870s. A young man waking from a dreamless sleep in a forest near the Napa Valley in California lifted his head from the earth and staring into the blackness screamed, Catherine! Catherine Aru! He says nothing more. He knows no reason why he should have spoken that particular name. The young man is Halpin Fraser. And although he is unaware of it at that moment, Halpin Fraser is in the deepest of trouble. Earlier that same day, he had gone hunting in the hills west of the valley, looking for doves and other such small game. Late in the afternoon, the sky had suddenly become overcast with threatening clouds, and he had lost his bearings. Where, where am I? Is this the way back? I, if I turn right, this rotting tree stump... No, that seems to lead nowhere. Everything's become so dark. How, how long have I been walking? It must be hours. Oh, I'm completely exhausted, my... My legs, I can't lift my legs another step to like lead. My head. Wait a minute, that, that little clean over there near the twisted roots of that large madrona tree, would it? Wouldn't it be the sensible thing to stop trying to find my way in the dark? Yeah, I'll go to sleep right here. Sleep. Sleep, I must get some sleep. And in the morning, when it gets lighter... Everything will be fine. With nothing under him but the dry leaves 
and the damp earth, and nothing over him but the branches from which the leaves had fallen and the sky from which the earth had fallen, Halpin Fraser fell asleep. Hours later, in the middle of the night... Catherine! Catherine LaRue! Catherine LaRue? Who is Catherine LaRue? I don't know. I have no idea who... Who are you? I, I can't see you. Get up. Up. And start walking. Walk where? It's still dark. Along that dusty road in front of you. They look so white. Where, where's that strange yellow-green light coming from? It's, it's blinding. Keep walking. Where does this road lead? Where are we going? Why, as I walk on my feet, making no sound. Look around you. Yeah. The body is casting no shadow. Uh, true. Uh, why should that be? What, what are those noises? Those broken whispers in a strange tongue. I, I almost understand them. But not quite. What do you think they are? What do you think they're saying? I, I don't really know. But those sounds seem like part of some monstrous conspiracy against me. A conspiracy against my body and against my soul. What are they? Walking helper. You will soon find out. I'm tired. Thirsty. I must find something to drink. Where are you going, Halpin? Over there. There's a pression in the ground. Where a wheel has passed, there's a little pool from a recent rain. I, I'm gonna drink from it. Go ahead, Halpin. Cup your hands and drink deeply. Drink for it. There's no water at all. It's a pool of blood. My hands are dripping blood. Down at the patches of dust between the wheel waves and the roads. I spat it with red as if it'd been raining blood. Where are we? Who are you? Keep walking, Halpin. Halpin, have you considered that possibly you're being punished for something? Punished? For something I've done, something I can't recall. Think back. Try to reconstruct in your memory the last ten years. No, I can't! I won't! Think back, Halpin. Think very hard. Think back. Think back. Think back. Halpin, it would seem your mother has done it again. Her party tonight is surely the peak of the Nashville social season. Mother certainly does know how to give a party. <laughs> Look at all those beautiful young women twirling around in their pretty party dresses. And the young men so handsome and gallant as they dance with them. In spite of the fact that some of those young men have only one arm or one eye. <laughs> Thanks to bleeding their hearts out at places like Chickamauga and Bull Run. Well, that's all past, son. We mustn't think back. Besides, we can be grateful that, uh, thanks to some of my good friends, you were spared the worst dangers of the battlefield. How well I know, Father. Will you just take a look at old Ben Ashford cavorting around on the dance floor with that handsome young lady? <laughs> Spry as a man half his age. Get to know old Ben, son. A real good man to know. I'm sure of it, Father. A person of great power can be most helpful to a young man beginning his career in the profession of the law. Are you listening to me, Halpin? Excuse me, Father. My mind was on something else for the moment. Hmm? Oh, I think I see what you mean. Isn't that Oscar Shelby's daughter over from Memphis? That's right. They're Ellen Shelby. Yeah. Juicy little morsel, isn't she? I admire your taste. Oh, Fraser, what dark and terrible thoughts are you trying to implant in the innocent mind of my darling son? <laughs> Evening, Katie. You look beautiful tonight. Oh, thank you, sweetheart. You both enjoying yourselves? It's a fine party, Katie. Oh, just trying to be a good wife you've been. And a devoted mother to you, Halpin. It's not every day that a young man just six months out of law school is promoted to a junior partnership in one of the most distinguished legal firms in the state. I'm real proud of you, Halpin, my love. This part is just my way of showing it. Well, uh, I did help a little, you know. Oh, look, there's Sue Cameron over there waving to me. Will you excuse me, Halpin, while I 
hobble over to on these poor arthritic legs of mine and see what's on her mind. Oh, and how then? After the party, do come into my bedroom and kiss me goodnight like a good boy, won't you? So many things I want to talk to you about. Her poor arthritic legs, her poor arthritic brain. There's nothing wrong with her legs. You know as well as I do, Halpin, she's still using that one to get your sympathy. She'll be asking you to dance with her any minute. Would you please excuse me, Father? Certainly, son. And convey your father's compliments to Mary Ellen Shelby. That's one of the prettiest pieces of woman flesh I've seen in many a day. Thank you, Father. I think you ought to know I'm about to ask that pretty piece of woman flesh to be my wife. But you're a grown man, Halpin. There's no reason for you to submit to these humiliations any longer. I will not listen to you talk about my mother. Halpin, dear, you just refuse to face the truth. The attachment she has for you... Is beautiful. Beautiful? Is that what you think? My Katie is devoted to me as I am to her. The way your mother thinks of you is not with the usual devotion of a mother for her son. And you... You even call her by her first name. I love my mother. But it's proper you should. But let's not talk about it anymore. Oh, the important thing right now is you and me. You know I love you more deeply and more completely than anything in this whole world. You love me well enough to leave Tennessee. To accept the offer your firm has made to establish a branch office in San Francisco. 2,500 miles away from Nashville with very few chances of ever returning. I think so. And breaking out of this sick iron grip of your mother and father holding you in, because that's what you're going to have to do if you want me. As long as you're by my side, my wise, my intelligent, my obstinate, my beautiful darling, I can do anything. Oh, I love you, Halpin. With all my heart, my body, and my soul. Kiss me. I'll tell Mother my decision tonight. After everyone's left. Oh, there you are, you two naughty children. Hiding away from the rest of us. Oh, not really, Katie. We thought we'd sit this one dance out, Mrs. Fraser. You have no idea how enjoyable it is to spend a moment or two... Alone with your very charming son. <laughs> I have a very good idea, my dear. And I'm delighted to share it with you. But just for a moment or two. Besides, such beauty as yours, Miss Shelby, should not be hidden from the public view. Would you both excuse me, please? I'll be right back. Well... There's no denying that Mary Ellen Shelby's a very attractive young woman. In a common sort of way. Mother. Katie. Mary Ellen and I are planning to get married. <laughs> uh, oh, you, oh you, can't, you can't really... You can't really mean that, Albert. I do, Katie. I've asked her to marry me. Oh, but you're still a child. How can you be thinking about marriage? I am 22, Katie. Exactly. Have your little fun, I say, if you must, but Mary... Oh, in heaven's name, why not? Well, you're just beginning your career as a lawyer. A career that promises to be a brilliant one. Besides, nobody could ever separate us from each other. Could they happen? Uh, well, <laughs> I I I'm not yet ready to give you up to another woman. I'm sorry I was gone so long. Forgive me. Uh, we'll be serving supper in the next five minutes. Before we do, Halpin, uh, Mr. Fraser, sir, I would be honored to be asked for the pleasure of this next dance. I'm awfully sorry, Mother. I promised it to Mary Ellen. You have? And the dance after that. And the one after that. <laughs> Fine beginning, Halpin. Keep thinking back and keep walking straight ahead, straight through this archway, this tunnel of overhanging trees. Oh, twisted yellow vines are blocking my way there. That gets me at the throat, choking me. Just follow the glare of that greenish light ahead of you at the end of the tunnel. You haven't far to go. Just a few more steps. 
steps help him. Help and friends him. Mother. We meet again, help. I told you we would. It's taken a long time. Such a long time. Since they placed me in my friend. We read that the grave unites us all. The grave, where even the great find rest. That small piece of the churchyard that fits every one of us. And for most, a grave gives comfort. But for some, as we are about to see, the grave becomes a place of unrest rather than a place of rest. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Ambrose Bierce himself, on whose story the death of Halpin Fraser is based, gave this definition of a grave. Done with the work of breathing, done with all the world, the mad race run, through to the end. The golden goal attained is found to be a hole. Having left its grave, its hole, if you like, the dead body of Halpin Fraser's mother taunts her son with a promise she made when she was among the living. Look at me, Halpin. Look into my eyes. Look into the drawn, bloodless face of your mother's hand here. Try to recall the promise I once made. Stop torturing me. You and all the rest of you in this weird place of evil. We'll help in good time. Remember that night ten years ago, after the war, after all the others had gone, you came to my bed. Sit closer to me, Halpin. Here, near the head of the bed. Now be a darling and. A massage the back of my neck, the littlest bit. Gently, lovingly, as long as you can. Oh, Katie, your hair is so long and so beautiful. And it smells so sweet. Oh. How's that? Feel good? Oh, wonderful, sweetheart. Wonderful. Your fingers are so strong. Ah. Oh. I'm beginning to relax for the first time in days. Katie, would you greatly mind if I decided to move to California to San Francisco? I'm not sure I understand you, son. My firm has asked me to set up a new branch in California. They, they think there can be a great future there for the company and, and for me. Surely you never go. Oh, well, you, you don't mean you seriously think of moving away from Nashville forever? Possibly, and, and Mary Ellen would go with me as my wife. I, well, I, I, I just never thought you'd have the heart to do this to me, Halpin. Not after all we've been meant to each other. Send us away with your blessing, Katie. It's the best way. Well, all last night, I, I, I lay awake, tortured by this miserable, painful arthritis. My fingers, my legs. And by the light of the full moon that was pouring in through the window, I kept staring at that portrait of you on oh, the wall over Katie, there. Katie, please. Now, don't interrupt please. me. There you were, as you are now, young, strong, handsome. And as I gazed at that painting, a mist, a cloud of some kind, seemed to cover over your beautiful features to cover your face completely. As I looked, I realized it had been painted as if a thin cloth had been placed over your sweet face. The kind of cloth is placed over the features of a corpse. Oh, Katie, that's ridiculous. Look at that painting now. Now, you must not laugh at me. As I continued to study the painting, I saw below the edge of the cloth the dark blue marks of fingers on your throat. As if you had been strangled to death. Mother, why do you tell me this? Now, what is that supposed to mean? It means that you may never go to California. Katie, dear, that doesn't make sense. Well, I can, I can hardly bring myself to say this. But if you go... Somehow you will meet your death there. 
in the next few years. <laughs> By strangulation. Now, don't you take it lightly. <laughs> I know what I'm saying. You take me with you. Oh, I'd be so little trouble. I, I hear they have fine medicinal springs over there. And in California, I could get better and I could... Oh, I could take care of my little boy. See that nothing evil ever happens Katie, to... you listen to me. You will be killed if you leave me. So will the Shelby girl. And I will die, too. Katie, Mary Ellen and I have decided we are leaving in a week. Well... In that case, I... Well, I suppose there's nothing for me to do except... give you the blessing you asked for. Thank you, Katie. Well, as a wedding present for your wife, I'll... I'll give her the brooch I wore tonight at the party. Grandma's pink car brooch? And her mama's before her. Been in the family almost 200 years. Mm. And for you... Well, go over to my dresser. And uh, open the top drawer on the right. You see anything unusual? This hunting knife? That's for you. My papa's pearl-handled hunting knife. Forged out of the finest Toledo steel. And, uh, uh, take that little portrait of me in the gold frame, too. Oh, thank you, Katie. You are most generous as well as understanding. Mary Ellen will be pleased, and I am most grateful. Kiss me goodnight, Halpin. Good night. My darling Katie. No matter where you go, no matter what may happen, I promise you that you and I will surely meet again. Sometime, somehow, someplace. I will not break that promise. Good night, my love. <laughs> to bed soon, Halpin. On my way, Mary Ellen. Oh, what a night. In all the years we've been in California, this must be the worst. Glad I didn't have to try to get around the streets of San Francisco tonight. <laughs> What's that you've been reading? Oh, uh, a little thing I picked up at the bookshop this afternoon by a 16th century English theologian. For greater change is wrought by death than hath been generally believed, whereas in general... The spirit of a dead man cometh back upon occasion, yet it hath happened that the body without the spirit hath sometimes walked. What kind of morbid nonsense is that? Listen to the rest. And it is attested by those who have encountered a corpse so raised from the dead that the cadaver hath none of the natural kindly affection it may have had in life, but only hate and evil altogether. In other words, a dead person can come back without a spirit and without a soul. Only in the shape of the body it had in life. And comes back as something hateful and ugly. He says it's happened. Oh, my darling, that is positively, unequivocally fascinating. <laughs> May I have that precious book, please? What are you doing, Happen? Tossing it in the wastebasket where it belongs. Oh. oh, silly to bother your pretty head with such depressing and disturbing thoughts. Now, if you don't mind, I am going to concentrate on you. Both soul and body. Both. With your kind permission, my darling Katie. Your darling who? I am not Katie. Oh, for, forgive me, sweetheart. That was a stupid slip of the tongue. Whatever made me do that? So, my dear son, on Sunday last, your darling mother and my beloved wife passed on to her maker. She was buried, of course, in the family cemetery here in Nashville. A pity you could not have been with her at the end. As she gasped her final breath, the last words she spoke were, Right helping that I shall keep my promise. He and I will meet again. Now, what exactly she meant by that, I haven't the slightest idea. In any event, the widow Struthers and I send you and your wife our kindest regards and warmest feelings. Your devoted father, Bo Fraser. I had the feeling all day long before this letter came that something was wrong. Oh, I can understand how you feel, Halpin. The letter is dated almost a month ago. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Halpin. 
Oh, now put out the light and do try to get some sleep. You said you had a busy day tomorrow. I have. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, dear. Where were you when I needed you most? I, I, I couldn't help it. I died without solace of my son's gentle hands on my cheek. Without his warm lips on my forehead. You never loved me, Alvin, did you? Never really loved me. You know, that's not... True, I always loved you, Kate. I always will. Are you all right? Are you all right? What? Can I get you something? Oh, oh. oh I'm, I'm, I'm fine, Mary Ellen. You've been talking in your sleep again. Uh, oh, my darling, try to go back to sleep. I don't think I can. Oh, let me get you a cup of warm milk. Oh, no, thank you, Kate. I don't think it... Katie? Not again, Halpin. I'm sorry. Katie is dead. And we are both well rid of her. I love my mother. That was always plain enough. To me and to the rest of the world. You take care of what you say and... Halpin, I will not be forced to compete for your love and your affection with a dead woman. She played on your sympathies with a whole bag of cheap female... You are speaking of my mother, a sick woman. A very sick woman. Oh, but not the way you mean. You were her disease. You, her young, handsome son, tied to her with an unbreakable cord that led right back to her womb. Mary Ellen, I think you've said enough. You've asked for it. Her strong young son who turns out to be nothing but a sad little weakling. Mary Ellen! Spit! That's enough! You will never speak to me that way again. You understand? And that is the last time you will ever strike me. The very last... Where are you going? What are you up to? Here are your precious mother's wedding gifts. The pink coral brooch she gave to me, which I have never worn. My grandmother's brooch, you've broken it. And this picture of your darling mother can keep it company. Mary Ellen. And here's your grandfather's beautiful pearl-handled honey. Are you out of your mind? Put down that knife. You'll not, not until I... Put that knife, you fool. Ah! Ah! Give me that knife. You kept me across my arm. Give me that nerve. Try to get away from me, you mama's boy. You great big nothing who just looked like you. a man. Watch out, Mary Ellen. I have the knife now. Go back to your mother's grave and let her suffer you. you. No. Help me. 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 with blood. I see you murder. You murder. I remember that night. That scream in the middle of the night. You begin to remember. You begin to realize why you are here. Uh, I'm not sure. Do you begin to realize where you are? Uh, I think. Yeah, maybe I do. A place from which few of us return. And are you beginning to recognize who I am? That voice of yours is so familiar. Uh, I'm sure I know it. It should be familiar, Halpern. And you should know it. Who are you? I am you, Halpern. You. It would seem that Halpin Fraser is being exposed to what we might call cruel and inhuman punishment. Cruel? Maybe. Inhuman or unhuman? No question. Will this unusual form of punishment come anywhere near fitting the crime? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Three. In ancient Britain, a dead body, a corpse, was also known as a lich. At the entrance to the cemetery, the coffin which carried the remains of the deceased would pass under the roofed lich gate and be placed with attendant ceremony on a lich stone to await the arrival of the priest or clergyman. The lich gate was sometimes called the resurrection gate. The body or lich of Katie Fraser, devoid of spirit or soul, seems to have resurrected itself. It continues to torment Halpin Fraser. Why, I... 
doing this to me? You... Are you trying to tell me that my being here some kind of atonement? For the murder of Mary Ellen. For ripping open the throat of your young wife. That is the very least you have to atone for. She was trying to kill me. Everybody knows that. Do they? Do they really believe that? Of course. Then why did you run away from San Francisco the day your wife was placed in her grave? Why did you hide away in that little mountain town? A town where your murdered wife was buried. In the graveyard of a little white church. A little white church. I, I don't know. Did you think changing your name after you came to the little town would help? You're trying to confuse me, both of you. But you did change your name, Halpin. From Fraser to LaRue. Of all names, why did you choose that one? LaRue! Why? Why? I, you, I don't know. Why? You torture me this way. You carry you above all my own mother. I am not your mother. Your mother is dead. Where is the love you always show for me? Where is the kindness, the gentleness? They all seem to be swallowed up in fear. And hatred, Halton. Cold hatred. Why? Why do you hate me? You still don't know why. I will not stay here and listen to you too. No. Where will you go? Where, Halpin? You'd like to run away? Go ahead. Uh, uh, I, I, I feel like lead as if they were glued to the ground. They won't move. Try your arms, your hands, your fingers. I can't move them either. It's as if they were frozen, Steve. Oh, take pity on me. The apparition which you see before you has no pity. No feeling. It's an empty shell of hatred. A body without a soul. And this living corpse wishes you everything evil. Nothing but evil. Because it loathes and despises you. Oh, God, help me, Katie. Help me! Holka! The night fog is so thick I can hardly see. Well, this way! Stay as close as you can. Hear those voices, help. They're coming to get you. What will I do? You're going to feel the agony of the hangman's noose around your neck. You'll hear the loud snap as it breaks. He's got it! I, I won't listen to you! Remember the dark blue marks I saw around your neck on I, your body. I remember, I remember the marks of the hangman's rope. The time has come, Halpin. The last breath is about to be squeezed out of your body. How much further, Carlson? Little White Church? No more than half a mile. There's no graveyard next to it. Imagine two grown men, you a county sheriff, and I a big city detective walking along a road on a miserable, foggy morning like this. Where you can't see your hand in front of your face. On their way to a little country graveyard. You know, I didn't get you here armed all the way from San Francisco just for a pleasant walk. Well, there is the matter of a $500 reward for the capture of wife killer, Mr. Halpin Fraser, most recently known as LaRue. Uh, every night, he comes to the old deserted graveyard with the little white church. Well, that's where they buried his wife. Uh, couldn't you fellas have sense enough to suspect that he might sometime come back to pay a visit to our grave? Well, in fact, we figured it'd be the very last place he'd return to. And he's been there every night for the last three weeks. And often stays till dawn. He's armed. Matter of fact, one night last week, he took a shot at me. If we can take him, half the reward is yours, of course. How much further? Well, a couple of hundred yards or so. Hold it a minute. Look at that strange light ahead of us. Even through this thick fog, kind of sickly, greenish yellow light. Could that be him? They, they found something. Don't move! All right, let's go. Follow me into the graveyard and watch the step. Right behind you. Just past his broken gate. All right, all right. Quiet down, boys. Quiet, quiet. There's nothing here. 
I've never seen anything like this in my life. You'd never even know these were graves. Just discolored stones and a few rotting boards leaning at the craziest angles. Some of the folk who live near here call it the village of the forgotten dead. And there's that strange light again. Like a green ball of light swirling around in space on its own axis. Seems to be beckoning to us. Shall we go see what it is? Now careful. Let's push our way through this growth of young trees. The dog's around to something. I don't see anything yet. Well, let's follow that light. What on earth are they after? Mr. Holker. Look over there. The body of a man lying on top of a grave. On his back. Legs wide apart. One stiff arm reaching up into the air as if to push someone away and the other near the throat. Both hands tightly clenched. It's beginning to disintegrate. Uh, well, he's been dead for weeks. Until we can file a formal report with the county coroner, let's make note of what we've got here. Well, I've got a notebook and a pencil. Good. Now take this down. Attitude of the deceased indicates desperation and resistance. To what? Look here. Here's a shotgun, a mesh game bag, remains of two birds. Yeah, now write this down. Evidence of furious struggle. The throat and face deep purple in color, almost black. The neck bent backwards, the eyes staring, ready to burst from their sockets. The lips dry and cracked open. The protruding tongue, black and swollen, throat covered with contusions. Not just finger marks, but bruises and lacerations. I'll bet five dollars this was done by Fraser, the man we're looking for. You'd better save your money, Geraldson. Look there at his feet under those leaves. A little red leather notebook. The initials HF on the cover. Anything in it? Uh, something scrawled in red ink. Hardly legible. Red ink? Uh, with some kind of crude writing instrument. Can you make it out? Um, I, I, Halpin Fraser, most recently known as Halpin LaRue. LaRue being my mother's maiden name. Admit to the murder of my wife, Mary Ellen Fraser. I'm now about to face my own death. Death by strangulation. Well, I guess that settles the identity of the body. Now, how would he know he was going to be strangled and still be able to write about it? I'm just reading what's written. Well, let's clear away some of the weeds in front of the headstone. Mary Ellen Fraser. He was murdered on his own wife's grave. Let's get the coroner up here right away. What What did you step on? A wooden board from the head of a grave. Fallen on the ground. Well, can you make out the lettering on the board? Uh, just barely. Paint's faded away and part of the board's rotted off. Let's see. It says... Here lies Catherine LaRue. F-R-A. That's all there is of the name. Born... January 29. Can't make out the year. Died June 13, 1874. Nashville, Tennessee. Nash... Well, what on earth is the headboard of a grave in Nashville, Tennessee? A whole continent away. Doing here in a graveyard in the Napa Valley of California. I wouldn't know, Mr. Holker. I wouldn't know. Catherine. Catherine LaRue. Catherine LaRue. Yes, Halpin. Here I am. I've traveled a long way. A lonely way. You and I, Katie. We're together again. Together as we once were. It's taken time. But at last, you and I are one again, Halpin. One again. You two are a body without a spirit. 
A body without a soul. Unloved. Unloving. Uncared for. Uncaring. But we are together again. Aren't we helping? My son. The drenching fog that had been growing all over the little white church began to extend over the entire valley like an endless canopy, opaque and gray. The birds sat like silent ghosts in their hiding places, and two lost, abandoned souls found themselves united in an eerie graveyard, united in hatred, bitterness, and spite. I'll be back shortly. Where are the new... Ambrose Bierce, whose tale was the basis for our mystery, was born in a small town in Ohio in 1842. He moved to San Francisco, where his writing became extremely popular. In 1913, at the age of 71... He disappeared into Mexico. Every trace of him was lost forever. Is it conceivable that he, like Halpin Fraser, might have met his end at the hands of some Mexican lich? It's interesting to speculate. Our cast included Michael Wager, Grace Matthews, Arnold Moss, Patricia Elliott, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. If it's time, I had some excitement.